Please and more coming up shortly. Do stay with us. And we first begin the news from the Greater Accra Region, where the news of the 533 positive COVID-19 cases recorded at a factory in Tum, in the free zone enclave of the Tema Metropolis, has heightened panic and fear among residents. The cases follow an outbreak compelling the testing of 1,300 workers of the factory. Josephine Intrije has been interacting with some residents. Ghana's case statistics for COVID-19 stands at 4,012. Recoveries have reached 323 with 18 deaths. Greater Accra alone stands at 3,436. 50% of these new cases recorded was as a result of an outbreak in a factory at Pung in the Tema Free Zones enclave. Out of 1,300 workers of that factory that were tested, 533 were confirmed positive. In the Ashaiman municipality, there are 53 confirmed cases with one death and eight recoveries. With a major port and three industrial hubs, business is brisk with a lot of activities. On a normal day at the Long Room, a popular center at the port for users, people troop there to process their document in order to clear. But this scene tells it all as many were spotted not observing social distancing protocol. Sources in the health directory told me the metropolis and Ashaiman are recording more cases, making it a hot spot. But what do residents in Tema and Ashaiman make of it? I buy no more. I'm on my information, you know. And I'm on my feed, you know. And I'm on my I'm on my cover. And I'm on the I'm on my yard. And I eat it for you. And I'm the alcohol. Government from time to time updates us on COVID-19 cases. They have the information. We that, that we are home don't have any knowledge. So when they tell us that a shaman has some cases, then we need to be careful. As for the COVID-19, I haven't seen anyone affected by the virus anywhere. All that you hear is that more cases have been recorded and others recovered, but I'm not afraid. Oh, Mr. Yeah. I am scared by the new figures. There is no one who is not afraid of death, but we wish we could see affected patients on TV so that it could convince others who are doubting. I think the virus, the virus is in the system, but... We should not be afraid because even fear, when we fear, when we eat, it will not digest. So one cannot say whether it is ignorance or people feel that we are back to normal times. Perhaps the law needs to be enforced so that people will abide by the safety protocols. Justin and JJ, TV3 News. Now, it's been a month since government announced the local production of nose masks in the country to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Five local companies were announced and tasked to produce 3.6 million nose masks in 10 days. There is more in the following report. On April 3, Ghana began the local production of nose masks. Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Abwaje, made this known at a press briefing on March 27. We've started the process of um, having some local production of one and one wearing is a local production. That's um, comfortable, it can be washed and real. And I think this is something we want to prove. We want to ensure, encourage all people to wear masks. Despite the assurances, frontline health workers still complained over the lack of personal protective equipment, with some threatening to redraw their services. Subsequently, five local manufacturing companies were selected to start producing nose masks immediately. On April 7, Health Minister Kweku Ajiman Menu announced at a press briefing in Accra that the companies had been tasked to make available 3.6 million nose masks across the nation in 10 days. The Minister for Trade has selected five big companies 
to sell 3.6 million face masks, these nose masks. They will start delivery by tomorrow. We will take delivery of 150,000 each day. And within the next seven days or so, the whole country will be flooded with these masks, especially for health workers. On April 11, Trade Minister Alan Chermantin paid a working visit to some four out of the five Ghanaian garment manufacturing companies selected by government to produce personal protective kits for the frontline health workers. Two weeks after, a directive for compulsory nose marks wearing was issued by the Greater Accra Regional Coordinating Council. Ghana's case count by then stood at 1,154, with the Greater Accra Region alone recording over 900 of such cases. A week after, a directive to all businesses to comply to the strict wearing of nose marks with a no marks no entry notice displayed at the entrance of their premises was also issued. This directive was backed by President in one of his COVID-19 addresses. As as of yesterday, the 25th of April 2020, issued directives to guide the production and mandatory wearing of face masks. We should all familiarize ourselves with them and apply them. One month on, we sought to find if these nose marks have hit the markets and if distribution has begun. Also, on our itinerary was whether all frontline health workers have received sufficient PPEs to help them in the fight against the virus. Our efforts to reach the appropriate bodies have been daunting. Attempts to contact the Trade and Health Ministry has also not been successful as our calls have gone unanswered. TV3 will keep digging to bring answers. Still on COVID-19, emergency medical technicians, paramedics and laboratory scientists are the unsung heroes in the fight against the disease. Although they play a pivotal role in helping curb the spread of the virus, their work often goes unnoticed. The following report focuses on the critical work of the frontline healthcare workers. They are the first people to come into contact with persons who have contracted COVID-19, transporting them to treatment centers across the country, yet their role is often underestimated. Emergency medical technicians and paramedics are part of frontline healthcare workers leading the fight against the coronavirus. Our role is to respond to uh, pick confirm COVID-19 cases. We normally pick mild and severe cases, be it from residents or the hospitals. As soon as they are confirmed to be positive, the surveillance team gather them and then they send their data to us. So they give it a number of uh, confirmed cases and then we move in there to pick them. It's not easy. In this pandemic, we, we, we find it difficult to work, but you know, it's, it's our duty and it's our responsibility as first respondents and as paramedics, we always need to be out there to save lives. So when the calls come, we just encourage our people and put ourselves together and respond to those cases. So. As Ghana records a spike in new cases of the virus, first responders are working bravely to save lives. Aside evacuating persons who have contracted COVID-19 or anyone showing symptoms of the virus, they also provide psychological support. And we encourage them because some of them, as soon as you call them, you see that fear, that panic is there. And we also normally don't send the ambulance to your resident. We always sometimes advise them to go to, to move to uh, a, a safe location because of stigmatization. Virologists and laboratory technicians cannot be left out as they also perform crucial tasks in health in Ghana, curb the spread of the virus. From taking samples to testing them, these frontline healthcare workers put their lives at risk daily. <laughs> Augustine Sego was leader of the 42-member team of Ghanaian healthcare workers who travelled to Liberia and Sierra Leone to help combat the Ebola pandemic in 2014. To him, it is an honour to serve Ghana in the midst of the pandemic. Instead of me to do it elsewhere, home is home. Even if I gather all the money outside, I will bring it home. So if my home is suffering this, then I better stop that one and I come home. This is my main motivation. And for the fact that my home needs me, 
my children to need me. And this pandemic is something that has no border. So I must be motivated by that and those two reasons to be here. The work of first responders, laboratory technicians, virologists and other frontline healthcare workers certainly cannot be underestimated as they play a vital role in helping Ghana fight the coronavirus. Porsche Gabo, TV3 News, Accra. And coronavirus continues to disrupt the global market and Ghana is no exception. Comfort and Usu is one of the many struggling entrepreneurs who invested her life savings in a fashion school barely two months before the lockdown. She shares her losses and regrets with Adwa Adubio Usu. Economic activity is back, at least, but for some people, business will not be the same. Some are yet to bounce back after the lockdown. Somewhere in Kanishi, one of the best communities in Accra is Comfort. Her dream of establishing a fashion school after two years of savings has become a reality. Because Africa fashion has gone to a different level, I thought it's wise to train people. Financially, it wasn't easy. Small investments I was having, then a good member from my family also adapt. Brother's dream was short-lived. I was projecting um, to have a lot of students, but I got five students. Others came to take the form, like 21 people or so, hoping to come, but because of the lockdown, I didn't hear from them again. Comfort started with five students with the hope of growing, as more students had already picked admission forms. Little did she know, her dream would be shattered as a lockdown made it impossible for her to do business. Some students who wanted to enroll could no more continue with the process due to obvious uncertainty. It's been more than a week since the lockdown was lifted, but she's yet to bounce back to business. She says most of the students are reluctant to return due to fear of contracting the disease. Business has also been poor as her clients had to reschedule the event. I even have clients who still have their wedding gowns and engagements things with me. They were supposed to do it at the end of March, but because of the virus thing, they couldn't come for it. It's there. And I think now I don't have money on any money on hand. It has really affected me. I couldn't even pay one of my workers. I met one of Comfort students who was there to help clean the place. She shared how the experience has been for her during the lockdown. Staying at one place is very stressful. Working and all that release tension. And staying at one place, you end up having a lot of thinking and you are concerned about so many things that you are not supposed to think about. What do you hope? The rich and mighty, the poor and innocents have all suffered from the impact of the coronavirus. A fashion school operator tells me how the lockdown has impacted her business. Even though she's yet to resume business, this has been daunting for her as her life savings were all put into this particular setup. Comfort is however hopeful that the future is promising. Indeed, there's hope for the future. In other news, the Accra Regional Police Command says some inmates in the Regional Police custody have tested positive for the coronavirus. Accra Regional Police Commander DCOP Frederick Edwinim said all the inmates have been quarantined and are awaiting test results. He made this known during a press briefing at the fumigation and disinfection exercise in Accra. A report by Frederick Clarence Williams. Ever since Ghana recorded its first case of COVID-19, there has been a lot of discussions on the various categories of the population who are at higher risk. One of the categories singled out is the prison population, which according to statistics is overpopulated by 5%.
The Accra Regional Command step up its fumigation and disinfection exercise of its facilities, including prison custodies, to curb the spread of the coronavirus disease. The commander, DCOP Frederick Edu Enim, said about three of the inmates have tested positive of the coronavirus disease. Some of the inmates have already contracted the disease. We have separated them from uh, the first suspects who will be uh, coming or who will, uh, will come into our custody. He indicated all the inmates at the prison custody have been quarantined and are waiting test results. He reminded the public to continue to adhere to the safety protocols to lessen the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the economy and social life. The four-hour exercise saw the charge office, prison cells, police quarters compound and other facilities of the Accra Regional Police Command fumigated and disinfected. And producers of caskets in Kumasi are anxious to see the lifting of the ban on social gathering to cash in. They describe the low sales volume in the wake of COVID-19 as unprecedented and a serious drain on their investments. Here is Benjamin Nedu's report. The ban on social gathering to contain the COVID-19 spread has adversely affected a number of businesses and institutions. With the suspension of funeral activities, families have been slow in burying their deceased relatives. This is taking a toll on producers of coffins. Kwabuna Owusu Banahine, one of the producers at Labour Roundabout in Kumase, says he has never experienced such a dip in sales since he started the business. <laughs> Prince Osai Kofi used to sell an average of five coffins a week with prices ranging between 500 and 3,500 CDs. But he has sold only two in the past two months. I do to come up with 20. I was 15. I don't cry a month in a day. Not a 10 year. If it matter, I will be able to find the alcohol. But because of say we ain't buy anything. Covid 19 ain't buy anything. I'm a. And I can't remember. We told the after November. Any December, you know, can you ain't be one and be no. If you are April, if you are March, you know the go. His colleague Kujuenchi shared similar sentiments. We ain't buy anything. No. Cry and talk. I can say no. Any night and talk. At this casket sales enclave, most of the workers are not wearing nose masks, though they are observing social distancing. Kobna Owusu Banahine explains why. Yeah, had it. Sa nose nose guard no. Yeah, how you soon that that. Yeah, had it because spray you need to no. And one a headache you you soon. Na na a do be a be on. Yeah, na heat. Abemupa. To some political news and General Secretary of the Opposition National Democratic Congress, Johnson Isidun Kitia, has taken a swipe at Vice President Dr. Bomia for his obsession with attacking ex-president John Mahama with fabricated data. Speaking on the key point, the general secretary of the NDC also rebuffed criticism about delays in announcing the NDC's running mate. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia interacting with the media after a COVID-19 meeting at the Jubilee House in Accra cautioned some key political actors to desist from politicking during this period of COVID-19. He touted gains made by the Akufuadu-led administration's handling of the coronavirus outbreak, maintaining it can be compared to how, as he put it, poorly the NDC handled the power crisis. 
But reacting to the Vice President's comments on the key point, the General Secretary of the NDC, John Sine Siedwin Ketia, said the Vice President is obsessed with the NDC's flag bearer, John Mahama, and must confront him with factual data. All that Dr. Baumia set out to do is to ask his own question and answer. He wasn't answering the specific allegation that President Mahama raised, which was that the government has been engaged in cooking figures, and that is, they present a set of figures to the parliament and present a different set of figures to the IMF and our development partners. Speaking on the same platform, Communications Director of the NPP, Yao Bwabi Asamwa, emphasized the Ekufuado government is able to handle crisis better than the NDC. According to him, the social interventions announced makes the party stand in poor position for December 7. It is not about the parameters of the crisis. He is comparing leadership the skills used, the approach, and the ability to manage and move forward. That's what he's comparing. And he's saying that given a crisis, the kind of crisis you had, you failed. You didn't exhibit leadership capacity, you didn't exhibit quality enough to overcome it. And people died in doing so. The NDC General Secretary questioned why the NPP keeps asking about the NDC's running mate when the NPP does not have a flag bearer. Every party has a way of oh, managing its affairs. Definitely. And uh, otherwise, NPP will not be concerned that we haven't announced our running mate when they don't have a flag bearer. <laughs> <laughs> they say they do. They don't. They, they don't have a flag bearer. They don't have a running mate. They have about 150 parliamentary mm -hmm. seats to fill, mm -hmm. and yet they divert people's attention onto our running mate. In general elections, the General Secretary of the NDC, John Sinansia Dunketia, has proposed a limited voter registration exercise in July. Now, the General Secretary, who insisted there will be no need for a new voters register, said the party is open for any engagement with the Electoral Commission on preparations. Minority in Parliament recently requested the Electoral Commission to brief Parliament on its preparedness for the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The minority leader, Haruna Idrisu, said it was important the House summons the EC to present their roadmap to the elections. The request was shut down by the majority leader. Speaking on the key points on the NDC's preparedness for the upcoming elections, the General Secretary John Cine Siodun Ketia thinks the Electoral Commission can hold a limited registration exercise in July, insisting there is no need for a new register. We don't see them having a problem. We don't see the electoral process in Ghana in any crisis at this stage beyond what the Electoral Commission decided to create for itself. Because normally, at this stage, you will be preparing to do a limited registration. You can do a limited would... registration somewhere in July, where I believe uh, so that is we would when have, COVID -19 we would is have a bit... seen how COVID-19 will progress. If there is a need to do limited mm -hmm. registration, July will not be too but late. But in the case where but it if happened... you want to do a full register, even today we are already late. Mm -hmm. So you, are, you have worked yourself into a problem. You're watching News 360 and there's more to come in mission after the break. Stay with us. Mission is supported by the Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid and the EU. The Cape Coast Metropolitan Assembly and the Education Directorate have replaced the roof of the Catholic Jubilee Boys School, which leaked badly any time it rained. This is after TV3 Mission highlighted the challenges facing the school. 
TV3 Mission first reported on the infrastructural challenges facing the Catholic Jubilee Boys School in 2019. The school, one of the oldest in Cape Coast, is over 80 years. Although it had a strong structure, the roof leaked badly any time it rained. School authorities were compelled to suspend classes any time there was a downpour. The situation impacted negatively on academic work. The Cape Coast Metro Director of Education acknowledged the challenges in an interview with TV3 Mission promising to fix it. Currently, a new roof for the school has been completed, which means pupils and teachers no longer have to suspend academic work when it rains. Jubilee school last year was not good at all in terms of even the, the, the roof. The, the whole system was leaking. And so the assembly, we went to assembly and assembly started preparing budget towards that. Unfortunately, Bright also came here and made uh, some cases and that really worked together and now the Jubilee school is back to its original state. Well roofed, no leakages, uh, uh, how the other uh, uh, building works have been done and then painted a final finish given to the Jubilee School. And now it's very really attractive. So it has even increased, not even, it has increased enrollment. You know, every child needs a very good facility to, to work. And the teachers are also highly motivated. The renovation has gone a long way to improve teaching and learning. Enrollment has increased. And when children are, when the teachers are teaching, the children pay attention to it, but we have enough facilities. That, that goes a long way to promote teaching and learning. Either to when, when it rains, the, children, the teacher cannot teach. But now when it rains, yeah, when I took over, it has rained once. There was nothing like leakage. Efforts are underway to rehabilitate the entire structure. Away from the central region, construction of a theater and ward complex is currently underway at the Thorn Health Center in the Thorn Katamansi municipality of the Greater Accra region. This is also after TV3 Mission reported on challenges facing the hospital. In 2019, TV3 Mission reported on infrastructural and logistical challenges at the Thorn Health Center. The Thorn Health Center, since its establishment 23 years ago, had not been upgraded. Inadequate staff and basic logistics hampered efforts at providing quality health care to patients. Authorities at the hospital wanted the health center upgraded to a polyclinic status to serve the needs of residents in the Thorn Katamansu municipality. After the story aired on TV3 Mission, the Municipal Chief Executive of Tunkatamanso promised the challenges facing the hospital will soon be a thing of the past. Through the Coastal Development Authority, the Tung Health Center will soon get a theater and a ward complex. And work is progressing. The contractor is waiting for a certificate to be paid to enable him to do the roofing. So now everything is intact. Centu Ceramics also cut the sword for the construction of a four-story hospital block. And we are now doing the ground preparations to start that particular project to be able to reduce the con congestion at the Bonef Center. Dr. Dankwa is a municipal health director of Bunkatamanso. If they complete it on time, now we'll stop referring patients or the my general. Some, some lives have been lost when they were transferring patients. So with this, we'll have a doctor or a, a specialist coming in to see all the uh, obstetrics and gynecological cases here. So we don't have to refer patients out. There are also plans of getting new, a new hospital. So when we have it, it would ease the decongestion at the OPD, just in case there's an outbreak or if the attendance are high. The completion of the theater is expected to provide quality health care to the estimated 120,000 residents in the Tungkatamansu municipality and its environs. We look at the good work you are doing. Um, if you report it without our notice, definitely somebody will also get it and send it on the different platform that this is what TV3 is saying about your municipality and then we quickly have to put our heads together to be able to find solution to the problem. When we talk to the mission, we should keep up the good work. At least 
when they came in here, it has shown results and people are working. People are, we are trying to get um, things improved, especially when it comes to our healthcare in Nepal, Kataman's municipality. And that's it for Mission. Mission is supported by the Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid and the EU. Thank you so much for your time. Now let's do some more stories. Tonight, and World Vision Global has projected some 72 million people of the world's population will be hit harder by poverty in the advent of COVID-19. In Ghana, poverty is said to have forced some parents to push their girl children into early marriage. Now here is a report by Stanley Ni Bleu. Vision COVID 19 would permanently leave a scar on global development and aggravate poverty, especially in vulnerable communities. 36 million children out of 72 million people projected to be affected globally by the impact of coronavirus would go hungrier, sicker, less educated, and exposed to more violence and abuse according to World Vision. It added the international community ought to prioritize long-term risk from the impact of COVID-19. In Ghana, World Vision has allocated $4.2 million to support the fight. Water, sanitation and hygiene facilities will be enhanced with the support. National Director Dixon Tunde said any hardship caused as a result of the coronavirus could force more girls into child marriage, thereby eroding the gains made. Poverty has been the real major drive uh, into uh, child marriages. Now with this COVID-19, more and more families will become desperate and that can actually force more girl children into uh, marriages. Uh, so those are the kind of things that we will be using this uh, additional funding to focus on. As classroom education remains suspended, World Vision Country Director wants internal control mechanisms to protect children who access the internet to study. Some people are propagating online learning for children. That has its own challenges because we don't want children to be exposed to pornographic material. Uh, so there have to be some proper internal controls uh, that will protect children uh, from experiencing more uh, hardships. World Vision West Africa Director Kala Denizad proceeds lifting of Ghana's lockdown amid soaring positive cases is not ideal. Once countries show that there is a slowdown in the transmission of the virus, then they can start removing some of the restrictions. But where we are now in Ghana, the cases are increasing at an alarming rate. So we're not at the point yet that I think that we can lift up um, those restrictions until we're sure that the education, the sensitization, and the access to PPEs can be put in place so that when these social gatherings occur, people are protected. In other news, some customers of the Electricity Company of Ghana are yet to benefit from the relief on tariffs due to the outbreak of COVID-19. While a number of customers have seen the benefits, it is yet to reflect on the bills of some. Ajwa Dubiobusu has been finding out from authorities what could have led to this. President Akufuadu announced the absorption of the entire electricity bill of the lifeline consumers, while residential and commercial consumers were to benefit from a 50% discount of their bills from April to June. The three-month electricity bill relief was to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on businesses and households. But the implementation, which started on May 1, has not been smooth for some who have not seen the relief reflect in their patches. I want to buy 50 cents, and I didn't get any or whatever. 
others were also excited and reflected in their purchase as announced. In the month of March, I spent 160 Ghana cities on prepaid. And just this month, which is May, I went to the prepaid vendor and then paid 20 Ghana cities for prepaid. And after, after buying the prepaid, when I checked my receipt, I saw that I had a charge value of 100 Ghana cities, 21 pesos. First of May this year, we bought credit. We bought 130 cities worth of credit. So we're supposed to get 130, but we had 188. So an additional 65.78 credit was added to what we bought. Some vendors who refused to speak on camera said they lodged a complaint with the electricity company of Ghana but were yet to receive feedback. But the Aqua East Public Relations Officer of the Electricity Company of Ghana, Isaac Innocent, has been giving some answers. We also realized that some of our customers didn't buy in April. So for such customers, they walk into the ACD vending point or the ACD stations in May and they didn't get the reliefs. Uh, we want to assure them that they should go the second time. Whatever is due them will be given. He has also been reacting to unexplained deductions experienced by some customers. For instance, the customer is supposed to receive 200 Ghana cities as a relief. The system would calculate the service charge for say two months or three months, looking at the absence of the customer at the vending point, and then take out that service charge from what the customer is due. So some of them saw certain amounts of money as credit, but they went to their homes and they didn't see that because the system had to deduct the service charges for the previous months, the customer didn't go to the vending point. He however assured customers yet to benefit from the package, they will be compensated in their next purchase. Watching News 360 and Sports News is next. And now let's begin the segment with this one. May 9th, 2001 will forever be remembered as one of the worst days in African football history. In this special feature, TV Trace Juliet Bewa recounts on the event and look forward to what Ghanaians have learned so far. Wednesday, May 9, 2001. The Accra Sports Stadium had just witnessed a beautiful game of football after rush hour. For the 90 minutes, it hosted the home side Accra Hat of Oak and the visiting team Kumasi Asante Kotoko. Two of Ghana's biggest clubs, football, did what it does best, bring joy to the thousands who had thronged the venue. But that excitement was short-lived as what is today Ghana's biggest sport in horror reared its head minutes after. All it took was a careless spark of fun misbehavior and agitation and a misjudgment on how to handle the situation. 126 people lost their lives till today, the highest for any number of casualties for a football match in the country and sits in a world's top stadium disasters of recent memory. Years on, the images of what was a dark Wednesday lingers for survivors and persons close to the deceased. The pain never goes away. Hawa Asare was 11 years old when the incident happened 19 years ago. The agony of losing her father has weighed heavily on her all these years. You see, you know, I'm 11 years. I'm in class 4. And now, I see the sea was stadium. I'm on food preparing. It's in your science engine. That's what I'm saying. This is the Ghanaian people and football fraternity. It is a blot on a sporting journey that had seen nothing of that magnitude prior to 2001. Herbert Mensah was chairman of Kumase Asante Kotoko at the time and has been lead campaigner ensuring the significance is not lost, helping affected families in the process. May 9th is something that it's the worst day in the sporting history of Ghana. Yeah, undoubtedly it is. 
Um, it's something which occurred 19 years ago. A few of us have made sure that the country never forgets and the world never forgets. We've teamed up over the years in being in conversation with the people from Hillsborough. Ellis Park, they've been here with us and joined us in the walk and the march. <clears throat> We've tried bringing families together, families in Kumasi and the rest have been to Accra and they've met to try and unite and to heal. And uh, the significance is just so big that everybody, yeah, everybody remembers May 9th. We are separate from the government organization that is responsible for looking after families. Uh, we have tried to highlight the situation. The need to stamp hooliganism out of the game cannot be emphasized enough and May 9 is a stark reminder. I feel sad because if anybody has had to be with a family who is grieving and is still grieving, they'll know to temper their activities when they go to the stadium. I went to people's homes who didn't have money to bury their families and they their deceased were lying on a carpenter's table covered in palm leaves. I went to people's families' homes who were hearts of oak and kotoko and watched them as they were in tears and in grief. If you have experienced that, you cannot possibly go to a football stadium and pull a gun. <clears throat> you cannot use your fists and punch somebody because you don't like what they've said or a decision that has been made. <clears throat> and I think that when you go through that, and I say if it's on a personal level, most people are aware that I carried nearly 30 bodies. You know, if you go through that to pick up somebody's body who is either dead or is breathing and you can feel the life passing away from them by the time I came back up across and descended and put the body down, Believe me, you will not want to behave in this way again. That call by Herbert and other well-meaning stakeholders cannot be taken lightly as the dangers of not abiding by stadium rules has far-reaching implications such as the struggle affected persons put up with long after disaster. All right, and that's all the sports we have for now. In more news tonight, heads of second cycle schools in the eastern region say over 1 million CDs are spent annually from the internally generated funds to fumigate its campuses to fight the spread of the bed bugs in schools. This, according to heads of the schools, has become a major challenge and called on governments to draw a budget to support schools for the exercise. A report by Frederick Clarence Williams. Vector Control Unit of Zoom Lion Ghana Limited step up its fumigation exercise of public senior high schools and some private in the eastern region. The exercise, which is under the auspices of the Ministry of Education, seeks to rid the schools of bed bugs and other insects. It is also to create a conducive learning environment for students. Senior high schools in the eastern region bemoaned huge monies used annually to fumigate to eradicate bed bugs. So it's been the biggest trouble that management is facing and spend a lot of money is infecting every term, every by the end of every semester you spend a lot of money on it. So there's a welcome news that you are coming around to disinfect the area and to control bed bugs and other forms of things say that you have around. The heads of the schools called for government intervention to enable them to have a conducive environment. The money that is given to us, we have to use some portions to be doing such. Uh, when we see that it is unviable for the students. But in my school there is also a dress care, something a medicine that we ask the students to get. And that one is their personal ones that they use. Okay. It's just about five cities. So when they get it, they are able to use them anytime. So, so far, it's somehow manageable. Classrooms, dormitories, laboratories, mattresses, among others, were all fumigated. A total of 117 senior high schools and six special schools were fumigated in the eastern region. You're watching News 360 from the News Hub. Let me now update you on Ghana's case count on COVID-19. As of yesterday, we had 4,012. Today, uh, 
251 more cases have been confirmed, bringing Ghana's total case count to 4,263. Um, four additional deaths have been recorded, bringing the total number of deaths to 22, while 300. 78 people have recovered. So as it stands now, Ghana currently has 4,263 confirmed cases of COVID-19. And in this segment, in I3 Foundation, in collaboration with Heaven Insecticide and Enapa, have presented a check of 5,000 cities each to all 16 delegates of Ghana's most beautiful 2019 edition. The check was presented to the Queen by the General Manager, Shared Services of Media General Winfred Kinsley Afo. So, uh... The check of 5,000 Ghana cities was presented to all 16 delegates of the 2019 Ghana Most Beautiful Reality Show. General Manager of Shared Services of Media General Winfred Kinsley Afo said the check is to aid in their respective social responsibility agenda in their various communities. As part of the pageant, Every year, the participants are supposed to carry out a project. Some do projects on HIV AIDS, some do on maternal, maternal mortality, some do on... Um, so there are different project topics that they choose. But based on what you think, which area you think you want to develop, because every community has their own issue. For example, those who come from the northern sector, there's this cerebral meningitis going on now. Somebody could decide if it's within your catchment area. That, because that is what is going to have resonance and relevance to the people. He urged the Queens to use a more sustainable approach in their projects to help in continuous growth. When it comes to projects that has to do with human um, behavioral change, it's more of outcome. Sometimes it's difficult to measure, but the most impactful thing is that what a society see you trying to do and so depending on what, what you do what you are going to do within the community you would um, be able to make some impact and it should be in such a process said that any, anybody who benefits from their initiative should be able to also translate it to their families winner of ghana most beautiful 2019 is equipment banaman this amount to help me to achieve what I've really intended to do because uh, this amount I think is somewhere enough to provide the PPEs and the hand sanitizers and I'll reach out to some companies to support me by sponsoring me to bring out what I've intended to do. She called for support from three foundation to help carry out more initiatives to benefit society. Three foundation, I will say God richly bless you for how far I've enjoyed your service and your support. God richly bless you for everything and we hope that that you support us in our Khan language that we say a bim meaning more to come or more is expected. And now to well, that's it for News 360. Before we go, a recap of the top stories and consternation among some residents of Tema and Asham and in the Greater Accra region following news of 533 factory workers testing positive for COVID-19. Also calls intensify for government to help Ghanaians struck uh, stuck abroad due to travel ban to return home general secretary of the ndc johnson isiodun ktia proposes limited voters registration exercise in july ahead of the upcoming general election a new my student disaster still fresh in the minds of victims nearly 20 years on On the international front, former U.S. President Barack Obama describes President Trump's administration's response to COVID-19 as absolute disaster. Right, and that will do for this edition of News 360. Remember to stay safe, wear your face mask, and observe all protocols. Have a good night.